So I've had the, the pleasure of working with Rami over the last year, and uh, I've really been excited uh, or just inspired by his enthusiasm for science. And uh, Rami spent many hours at this workstation here, which is our uh, hyperbaric atomic force microscopy. And uh, we newly in recently installed uh, uh, confocal microscopy. Rami did fluorescence microscopy of calcium imaging. Spent many hours here and has gotten acquired some really interesting data. So during his time here, uh, Rami, uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun in the lab and outside the lab. Um, so getting back to my project here, uh, we know CNS oxygen toxicity res results from breathing oxygen at uh, typically at a pressure above 2.5 atmospheres. And uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is used for uh, a range of, of disorders, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, diabetic wounds, uh, we heard about. And uh, most importantly, from, from our perspective, uh, is that uh, diving is also a major, is the limitation, uh, or CNS oxygen toxicity is the major limitation uh, for uh, Navy SEAL divers. So at a depth of just 50 feet, the, the length of exposure at that depth is, is uh, 10 minutes. So we wanted to, when I first got involved in this project, my, my first funding uh, was to look at the mechanism uh, for CNS oxygen toxicity. Now, and to do this, uh, it was specifically to characterize the cellular and molecular correlates of CNS oxygen toxicity and uh, to develop a model of CNS oxygen toxicity. And, uh, and most importantly, or, or more recently, to test the hypothesis that metabolic enhancement therapy, uh, mentioned briefly by, by Jay, with uh, ketone bodies as just one source of, of metabolic substrate we're interested in, uh, to test the hypothesis that th this would delay CNS oxygen toxicity in rats. So to, to actually examine the, the cellular and molecular mechanism of oxygen toxicity, we use a wide range of uh, methods in our lab, including atomic force microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, uh, laser scanning confocal microscopy, which is actually adapted to the AFM so we can do uh, them both together, uh, electrophysiology and radio telemetry. Now we've adapted these, uh, what's unique about our lab is that we've adapted these to hyperbaric chambers. And uh, we've published uh, the testing and the use of these chambers and using uh, biological uh, samples in, inside these chambers. And uh, most recently we developed atomic force microscopy and this allows us to do a variety of experiments on cells. Uh, for example, we can look at the high resolution, we can get a high resolution scan of the surface topography of the cell uh, under normoxic conditions and in response to hyperbaric pressure, hyperbaric oxygen. And uh, we, we've demonstrated that uh, membrane lipid peroxidation or distortions in the membrane that uh, we call membrane blebbing is the physical correlate of membrane lipid peroxidation and correlates with uh, malondialdehyde production, which is a lipid peroxidation uh, byproduct. So we have a, a range of techniques from AFM down to the, the sub-nanometer level all the way to uh, radio telemetry, the whole animal experiments. So and as, as Jay showed you, that the rat model uh, in these telemetry experiments allows us to uh, detect uh, subtle changes in brain activity and to correlate uh, seizure activity, uh, the, the latency of the seizure activity. Uh, and we can screen for a lot of uh, different uh, therapies that can delay the latency to seizure. So uh, our model of, our, of the cellular mechanisms of CNS oxygen toxicity has resulted uh, from a series of experiments and I won't go through all the series and kind of brief, briefly explain the flow of logic here, is that we know under hyperoxic conditions or an increase in uh, oxygen concentration that there's uh, an increase in superoxide anion production and an increase in nitric oxide. And this can uh, stimulate the production of more uh, 
more damaging uh, reactive oxygen species, including uh, the hydroxyl radical. And we know that this causes uh, membrane lipid peroxidation, protein oxidation, and protein nitration. And using AFM, we've, we've demonstrated that there's a correlating increase in membrane damage or membrane lipid peroxidation as we increase the concentration of oxygen. And we think that these uh, correlates of, of hyperoxia or hyperoxia-induced uh, oxidative damage uh, precede uh, the, the results we see at the level of the cell, which is neuronal excitability and, and also metabolic stress, which is contributing to this. And we see a drop, uh, the membrane potential, there's a depolarization, an increase in firing frequency, and an increase in intracellular calcium in response to hyperbaric oxygen. And uh, these are the precursors to uh, uh, disruption in uh, the brain activity, which contributes to the seizure, the tonic-clonic seizure that we can detect with uh, EEG. So uh, just to recap, hyperoxia induces uh, superoxide anion production, and we think this is coming uh, primarily from the mitochondria. And, uh, and when we measure the levels of superoxide anion production, um, in normoxia and under hypoxia, hyperoxia condition, we can uh, attenuate the response to that with uh, metabolic substrates, including beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body. And uh, the oxidative stress we measure is membrane lipid peroxidation with uh, atomic force microscopy, and this correlates with malondialdehyde production. Uh, we've demonstrated previously, uh, Jay has, that uh, there is an increase in the, uh, the amplitude of the orthodromic population spike in response to hyperbaric oxygen in the hippocampal brain slice preparation. And there is an increase in these secondary spikes that may be analogous to seizure activity. So sort of like seizure in a slice. So, and we think that, that this activity is essentially going on uh, during a uh, CNS oxygen toxicity. So there's various strategies that have been attempted to uh, delay and prevent CNS oxygen toxicity. The obvious one to, to look at, to examine, is antioxidants. So uh, these have largely been unsuccessful in uh, delaying uh, the latency to CNS oxygen toxicity. So although they, they do work well in vitro, and we've demonstrated that they can reduce uh, cellular oxygen toxicity in vitro, but, but not so much in vivo. Another strategy is uh, anti-epileptic drugs. So we know that, that the administration of anti-epileptic drugs would have to be very high to, uh, to really delay the onset of CNS oxygen toxicity uh, when we study these in animal models. And, uh, and the warfighter, to administer an anti-epileptic drug to a warfighter, uh, would not be a good idea because of the uh, side effects associated with them, uh, primarily cognitive. They have, they're usually fairly sedating. So what it attracted me in the literature is that there's a body of literature that shows that starvation, or I guess what you would say prolonged fasting, starvation is usually thought to be pathological, uh, it confers a significant uh, delay, a 300% delay in the latency to seizure. And this work was done uh, by Bitterman and, and Chavko, and I became interested in, uh, in mimicking the effects of prolonged fasting. So the question I had was, how does starvation change brain metabolism? So we know from, uh, from as early as actually 400 BC, Hippocrates wrote about fasting and seizures. Uh, we know that starvation forces a shift in the brain metabolism and that uh, early reports, there's early reports of fasting actually curing epilepsy. So, and a lot of the, the seminal work was done uh, at Harvard Medical School by uh, uh, George Cahill, who recently passed away. Uh, and he was kind of a consultant on this project when I started, started this project. So uh, George Cahill and uh, his lab, uh, Oliver Owen, actually did a series of, of interesting studies where they fasted medical students for, uh, for 40 days. And uh, this is back in 1967. 
And what, what they showed in a series of very elegant studies at Harvard Medical School is that in the fed condition or under normal conditions, the brain essentially is using 100% glucose uh, for its energy. But in, in response to prolonged fasting or starvation, uh, the brain has the metabolic flexibility to shift from using glucose to using ketone bodies for fuel. So uh, after a, a week or more of starvation, uh, up to two weeks, you get about 66, about two thirds of the energy from, that the brain is using is derived from ketone bodies. Because glyc your glycogen stores have essentially been depleted and you make some gl glucose through gluconeogenesis from the glycerol backbone of fatty acid breakdown and also through some gluconeogenic amino acids. But uh, what we see here is that uh, the, the students that fasted for 40 days had uh, a sharp rise in uh, the levels of ketone bodies, uh, namely the beta hydroxybutyrate, and they had a decrease in blood glucose, but you have powerful homeostatic mechanisms that kind of maintain glucose at a low level and prevent you from going severely uh, hypoglycemic. So the brain is essentially shifting, so ketones essentially replace glucose as the predominant fuel for brain metabolism. So they took this, this experiment a little farther, and uh, work like this could never be, <laughs> could be duplicated today due to the IRB, but uh, what they did is they actually administered 20 units of insulin uh, to these subjects, and this would typically be, put you into a diabetic coma, or would be fatal. And what they, what they demonstrated in these patients that uh, their brains are essentially keto-adapted. So their brains are, have been weaned off glucose as a primary fuel, and uh, they produce severe hypoglycemia that would typically be fatal. And uh, what this demonstrates is that <laughs> all the patients survived. I, I think uh, most, most interestingly is that all of them were asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. So it's, it's a really powerful demonstration that the brain can use an alternate source of energy uh, for its metabolic needs, its metabolic demands. And this has implications for a wide range of disorders from you know, diabetic shock to traumatic brain injury to uh, a variety of, of neuropathologies associated with impaired brain metabolism. So ketones then are, uh, can preserve brain metabolism during severe hypoglycemia. So we know just a little background in, in, uh, in brain energy metabolism is that the normal pathway that we're used to is that uh, glucose is shuttled into cells in the brain. Uh, primarily, it's, uh, the shuttling is through uh, the glucose transporter three. And oxidative stress impairs uh, glucose transport. Traumatic brain injury impairs glucose transport. A variety of pathologies, Alzheimer's disease actually, uh, has shown uh, impaired glucose transport primarily due to a downregulation or inhibition of the GLUT3 transporter. So, and we know that you know glucose uh, through glycolysis is generates pyruvate, and uh, it's thought that the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is really the rate limiting step for deriving uh, acetyl CoA to drive the, the TCA or the Krebs cycle to make the reduced intermediates for the electron transport chain. Now, this whole this uh, this can be bypassed by the administration of ketone bodies. So during starvation, these rise pretty sharply, but after you know several days of, of starvation. So you have beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate that can be shuttled through the membrane uh, by the monocarboxylic acid transporters. And uh, these are very efficient uh, fuel sources to, uh, to generate ATP production. Uh, so it's known, uh, Hans Krebs did, did the early work and uh, his student Richard Veach basically showed that there's a higher, uh, uh, there's a higher delta G of ATP hydrolysis. You derive uh, considerably more energy from ketone bodies uh, per carbon molecule than you do for glucose. And, uh, and that's pretty significant if we're talking about uh, substrate delivery to the brain or enhancing uh, brain function and mitochondrial function. So a quick review of ketogenesis is that uh, the acetyl-CoA to, to drive ketogenesis is, is uh, generated from fatty acid uh, or beta-oxidation of, uh, beta of fatty acids. Uh, 
So what happens is that the acetyl-CoA accumulates with uh, beta oxidation of fats and um, there is a stepwise conversion, uh, step-like conversion of uh, acetyl-CoA to the primary uh, uh, ketone bodies that, that actually assist in brain, met in brain metabolism. So when, when we start fasting or when we deprive ourselves of carbohydrates, uh, we start releasing free fatty acids for fuel. And our body runs very efficiently off fatty acids for fuel, but fatty acids can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So the brain becomes starved of energy. So this, uh, ketogen this process of ketogenesis is performed in the liver, and the main function is to supply a metabolic fuel to the brain under uh, periods of starvation, because the fatty acids can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So these ketone bodies do, and they're also a very efficient fuel source for the heart.